Hello and welcome to Curious Collections from the Benson Memorial Library. I'm sure many of us have fond memories of visiting the movie theater for a show, either in huge multiplexes like Tinseltown, the drive-in, or even the local single-screen cinema. Titusville has been home to a number of movie hotspots over the years, so in today's episode we're going to explore the history of moving pictures in our town starting clear back in 1897. Let's roll the film. Prior to the advent of movies, people in town would visit the Opera House on South Washington Street for live performances, concerts, operas, plays put on by the local dramatic club. Beginning in 1897, though, a new sort of performance was on the bill. An ad in the March 19th edition of the Titusville Morning Herald that year announced that the people of town would soon be able to view the Wizard Edison's new invention, the projectoscope, a machine that puts life into pictures. Now, the idea of moving pictures wasn't entirely unheard of at this point. Roughly four years earlier, Edison's lab had premiered the kinetoscope, a device where a spool of pictures was run in front of a light inside a large box by use of a hand crank, and a single viewer could watch the pictures through a magnifying peephole positioned on top of the box. Competition between moving picture inventors was fierce at this time, and Edison soon realized he would have to branch out from these single view machines into projection in order to stay relevant. Moving pictures soon became a regular part of the Opera House repertoire. Besides Edison's projectoscope, the Lyman Howe War Graph was featured, which showed images of things like the Battle of San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War, as well as the crowning of King Edward VII. In April 1904, there was a showing of The Great Train Robbery, a 1903 Western film from the Edison Manufacturing Company that clocked in at roughly 12 minutes long. It featured effects that were popular at the time, such as close-ups, wide shots, and location shooting. For between 25 and 75 cents, Opera House patrons could watch the Western as well as see a vaudeville show headlined by James Parr, the champion wrestler of England. By 1906, Titusville had two dedicated moving picture houses in addition to the Opera House. The Theatorium, which was located on South Franklin Street, and the Wonderland on West Spring Street in what is now Shidey Park. This type of theater was known as a Nickelodeon since admission to the show was only five cents, and they became wildly popular. Besides moving pictures, the bill would also feature vaudeville acts and something known as illustrated songs, where a popular piece would be performed by a live singer while pictures were flashed up on the movie screen to accompany the lyrics. 45 minutes of entertainment for a nickel, or about $1.41 today, was quite a bargain. Nickelodeons often went into vacant store spaces, and so they weren't set up exactly like the movie theaters we know today. Wooden chairs or benches would be set up in close rows to maximize the amount of paying customers, and with no ventilation and quite a bit of heat being generated by the projecting film equipment, the house would get stuffy very quickly. One older man who reminisced about visiting the Nickelodeons mentioned that they would put bottles of perfumes up on shelves on the wall to help with the smell in the close quarters. The floors were also level, so you had to hope that you didn't end up sitting behind a woman in a fashionable hat. In early 1907, after a fire in their previous location, the Theatorium had moved from South Franklin Street to 40 West Spring Street. Um, today that would be next door to the Algrunix building, roughly where the parking lot is across the street from the post office. West Spring Street was rapidly becoming the center of the Titusville Theater District. There were at least four other movie houses in 1908. The Star, which was formerly the Wonderland, the Theatorium at 40 West Spring, the Ideal Theater at 13 West Spring, which had previously been the Ideal Shoe Store, and the Alhambra at 19 West Spring. I say at least four houses because this picture, which we've been given gracious permission from the Drakewell Museum to share, features a Nickelodeon by the name of Dreamland, taken by local photographer John Mather sometime around 1908, which is supposed to have been also on West Spring Street, although there's some controversy over its exact location. In the photo, it shows the decorative front of the theater, as well as the evening's attractions on the bill. Nickelodeons would also attract customers by placing a phonograph just outside on the boardwalk and playing it throughout the day to attract attention which they certainly did, judging by the angry letters to the newspaper from other local merchants who said that the noise was driving away their customers. As Nickelodeons grew more popular, the interiors began to improve. 
state regulations mandated that there had to be aisles of a certain size in each theater, and some places actually revamped the floor so they would slant down toward the stage to improve visibility from the seats in the back. In December of 1909, a new theater appeared on West Spring Street that was the latest in safety and comfort, the Orpheum. The Herald noted that it had chair seats to hold 600 people with the slanted theater-style floor, a fireproof projection box, which was an issue with early projection equipment, a plastered and frescoed interior, a large stage, commodious dressing rooms for the vaudeville actors, and all-electric lighting with no uncovered wires. Shows at the Orpheum advertised refined vaudeville with acts like the Dancing Kids Chester and Johnson and the Juggling Millers, as well as films that were said to be changed daily. In 1915, the Orpheum was torn down to make way for the new post office, but the owners were able to find a new location and reopened at 122 West Central Avenue. The Orpheum stayed at West Central until its closure in 1954, and the building was raised in 1955. The 19-teens were the heyday of silent film in Titusville. Theater goers could see such acting greats as Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, Dorothy Dalton, Alice Brady, Douglas Fairbanks, and even Harry Houdini in his film The Master Mystery. Eventually, silent film gave way to what were known as the talkies. The Orpheum ad for April 2nd of 1929 mentions a new upcoming attraction, Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer, which would become the first commercially successful talking motion picture. By this time, many of the smaller theaters in town had been phased out, and only the Opera House, which was now known as The Grand, and the Orpheum remained. Not for long, however. On September 21, 1939, on the same lot that had previously housed the Alhambra, which later became known as the Rex and then the Princess Theater, a true movie palace opened. The Penn Theater, owned by Warner Brothers, who also owned the Orpheum on Central Avenue, had its gala opening night featuring the movie Dust Be My Destiny, starring John Garfield and Priscilla Lane. The paper that day had an entire section devoted to the new theater, an ultra-modern picture house, one of the finest to be found in the U.S. A description of the building mentions that the foyer interior was covered in striped cloth of pink, white, and green, with large mirrors on either side of the room, and the exterior was covered in hundreds of square feet of new, high-finish colored glass, beginning with black at the base, with a delicate gray for the walls and a fine red border along the top. The auditorium had 950 seats of the latest red design plush chairs, with a large center section of seats and two wings separated by two aisles. The manager at the time also announced that the theater would change shows three times a week, with a new film shown every Friday, Sunday, and Wednesday. Ticket prices began at 10 cents for children and 25 cents for adults for the matinee showings, and evening shows were 15 and 35 cents. Opening night was a tremendous success. People began queuing up outside the ticket booth starting at 4.30 in the afternoon, and by showtime at 7, the house was nearly filled to capacity. The Penn continued to operate on West Str Spring continuously until 1982, when it closed, supposedly temporarily. The building was put up for sale on and off between 1984 and 1988, but after years of vacancy, it was in a sad state of repair, and there were no funds to fix it. Finally, in April 1988, the building was torn down to make way for the new Burger King parking lot. For a more in-depth look at the history of the pen, you can check out the article Remembering the Pen Theater by Library Director Jess Hilburn at the blog nwpastories.com. If you have memories of visiting the pen or the Orpheum, drop us a comment below. We love to hear from you. Until next time, we'll see you in the stacks. Bye now.